Well, just before we look at God's word, let's, uh, let's pray for a moment. Lord, I thank you for the gift of this place. This building that you've provided from saints that have gone before us, who have faithfully gave, who faithfully sacrificed, who faithfully worked, to have a place where people might gather together to meet with you, to sing your praises, and to hear from your word. God, I think of brothers and sisters in this world who have no place to meet because of persecution, because of injustice, because of lack of resource for for a variety of reasons, God. There are many who don't have a place to gather, and yet they gather anyway as your church, as your people, to do the very same thing that we're doing here this morning. But, oh Lord, I, I believe that it is a special gift to have this place, to have this time, to have this freedom to gather together and to worship you. Lord, may we understand, may all who are gathered here today understand that it is We have come here to worship you, to make ourselves low before you, and to exalt your name and your being. Lord, I thank you for this time of reflection upon your word. I I thank you for this man, Ezra, who served you. And God, as we look into this book that he has written for us, as we look into the history of your people, the people of Israel, I, I pray that you would help us Glean for us lessons on how to worship rightly and help us to see the priority of worship that is in your heart and place it in our hearts as well. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All loving parents, all loving parents discipline their children. We do this in the hope that they will alter their poor behavior and begin to behave properly. Uh, Usually a a punishment or a consequence does not come immediately. Usually there's a period of warning first. Uh, At our house, I've recently implemented uh, three rules at our kitchen table uh, because our our kids have a habit of... uh, not behaving properly at the table. So I thought, what's a way we can, we can work with these kids to help them along so that we can actually make it through a meal in a reasonable amount of time? And so I implemented three rules, and it's e- so it would be easy for them to remember. So here they are. Chew with your lips closed. That's one thing. And I, it's funny how kids learn rules, because whenever I don't, they say, Daddy, what are the rules? Anyway. Uh, So chew with your lips closed, that's one. Uh, Use nice manners. So say please and thank you. And sit properly in your chair. I can't tell you how many injuries we've had at the kitchen table because kids have fallen off chairs and knocked chairs over. Uh, Boy, this is a bunny trail, but I have to tell this story. One time Olivia was uh, not sitting properly on her chair and she she fell off her chair, but she managed to fall off her chair on her feet. The bad part was the chair tipped over and... And the back of the chair whacked right on her baby toe and peeled a big chunk of skin off. And it was a really ugly scene. But that wouldn't happen if you sit properly. Well, whenever there's a violation of one of the rules, I generally do two things. I ask them to tell me the rules. uh, Because when they violate them so much, it's a really good opportunity to memorize them, right? If they have to say them back to me every time they mess one up, then they'll know them off by heart. And the second thing is I tell them about a consequence for not obeying the rule. Uh, Typical consequences in our house are uh, no dessert, uh, no TV, or going to bed straight after bath. That's probably the worst one, going to bed straight after bath. Sometimes our children will listen right away. Sometimes they just have to simply point out that they're not behaving properly and they'll Sorry, Dad. And they'll fall right in the line and do what they're supposed to. Other times, they tend to test a little bit. You know, test the lines. Usually after a couple of warnings, uh, usually two or three warnings, I'll say, do you guys think that Daddy is not serious and that I will not give you a consequence? Is that what you think? Oh, no, Dad. We believe you'll give us a consequence. 
And then they go right back to behaving poorly. Well, two or three warnings, and I implement the consequence. And that's generally followed by some sadness and some crying. Uh, Last night, Jilly had to go to bed straight after her bath, and it was quite a scene. She was rather unhappy. And I will say to her, and I said to her last night, I warned you. Did I not warn you? Many times. Last night, I warned her six times, which is more than I usually, that's more grace than I usually extend. I'm a heart. I'm a hard guy, you know. I warned you, and you decided not to listen. So now you have to have a consequence. Most parents, myself included, don't enjoy giving their children consequences. I'm sure all of us would be thrilled if our children were perfectly behaved all of the time, and we never had to discipline them because they were just the perfect kids. Any parents here today have the perfect kid? No, one, yes. Talk to Johan after and figure out what he's doing because he's doing something different than I am. Most of us would enjoy it if our kids were just perfect, but the reality is that that doesn't happen. And so we must discipline them. As hard as it is on both parent and child, the hope is that when the consequence is over, they will have learned their lesson and decide to do better in the future. After a consequence is over, I will often tell uh, my children, and I I told this to Jillian last night, that I discipline them because I love them very much. And I'll, I'll give them a hug and let them know that I'm doing this because I care for them, not just to be a mean dad. Most of the time when the punishment is over, there's a great sense of relief and joy. You know, the tears go away, it's all done, and we're happy again, and we go back to life as normal. Well, in many ways, that's what we have when we come to the book of Ezra. So for over the next several weeks, we're going to spend some time together, and we're going to work our way through the book of Ezra. Now, this is not a book that we normally go to, so if you're unfamiliar with where it is, it's in the Old Testament, and it's just after Second Chronicles. So if you're flipping through and you see First Kings, you're getting close. And then you just flip a few pages and you'll see Second Kings, First Chronicles, Second Chronicles. And then you'll see Ezra. And that's where we're going to spend our time. To say that God was patient with the people of Israel is an understatement, to say the least. Time and time again, From the time they left Egypt to the time they entered the promised land and all through the history of the kings, time and time again, God warned the people about their idolatry, about their injustice, and about their pride. And time and time again, God would say, there's going to be a consequence. And time and time again, they didn't listen. He had time and again sent seasons of discipline into the life of the nation where they would go through struggle and difficulty, whether it be from other nations around them or whether it be from famine or many other types of discipline. God had disciplined them many times. And again and again, time and again, after they were disciplined, they would go back into their idolatry and their other sins. God sent prophets to warn of the great judgment and destruction that would come if they refused to change. Rather than repent, they had the prophets killed. Have you ever counted to three with your kids? I've kind of adopted that. You know, you think that you won't do things that your parents did, you know, and then you find yourself doing them. And I'll often do that. You know, anybody else count to three with their kids? Come on, can I get a witness? Nobody. Okay. Right? They're, they're doing something, and, and I'll say what the consequence is going to be, and then I'll go one. And uh, typically, Olivia will jump right in line at one. Jillian usually waits to two, sometimes three. You know, you go two and a half, two and three quarter, two and 32 sixty-fourths, you know. 
And I kind of look, I kind of think about that when I think about the people of Israel and all the warnings and all the messages and all the signs that God sent to the people of Israel. It's like a, one, waiting for them to respond. Two, waiting for them to respond. Three, no response. They continue on. Well, God got to three with the people of Israel. You remember, um, well, hopefully you remember last summer when we did the series in Daniel and we looked at when the, when the Israelites went into captivity. It was a man, a king named Nebuchadnezzar. God had, had caused Nebuchadnezzar to flourish, to prosper. He had given him authority and control over the whole known world. And using that authority and control as the king of the known world, he rode in and to Jerusalem and he took captives. He took many prisoners, of which Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were four of the prisoners that went off into exile. And after a short period of time of, the, of, of many people being in exile, there's a bit of a revolt in Jerusalem, and Nebuchadnezzar rides in again, and he levels the joint. He destroys the city of Jerusalem, and he destroys the temple, and the whole nation is sent into exile. People of Israel are, are cut off from the promised land. They're cut off from the temple. The temple, the prescribed place of worship for the nation. You know, when we gather here in this building to worship God every week, uh, in, in the nation of Israel, there wasn't churches in every town. There were was, there was some synagogues. But for the most part, the, the, the right place to go, if you really wanted to connect to God, if you wanted to offer sacrifices, you had to go to Jerusalem. You had to go to the temple. It was the place where people met with God. And the book of Ezra begins at a time when the exile was ending. When some of the people were going back to the land of of Israel. Verse 1 tells us in Ezra chapter 1, if you have your Bibles open to the book of Ezra, Ezra chapter 1 in verse 1 tells us that the people's return corresponded with the fulfillment of the prophecy spoken through Jeremiah. Jeremiah was one of the prophets who had tried to warn them, tried to tell them about the coming destruction, but they failed to listen. Now just keep your finger in Ezra for a moment and flip over to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 25, verse 11, and we read the prophecy that, Israel, that, that Jeremiah makes about the captivity, about the coming destruction. Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations will will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, the land of the Babylonians, for their guilt, declares the Lord. And I will make it desolate forever. Then you go over to Jeremiah chapter 29. This is after the exiles are already been taken captive. They're in the land and there's some false prophets telling them, that as they're in the land, don't worry, this is just a, this is just a short time out. God's going to get us out of this uh, really soon. And Jeremiah says, you know, don't listen to these guys. That's not, it's not going to be a short exile, but rather it's going to be a long exile. Look at Jeremiah 29, verses 10 and 11. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. So it's going to be 70 years. But, but here, listen, people of Israel, Jeremiah says. You know, you've never listened before. Try it. <laughs> listen. When 70 years is over, God will deliver you and bring you back to the land. Verse 1 tells us that uh, as the book of Ezra is beginning, that this was in order to fulfill a prophecy made by Jeremiah. So Jeremiah, over 70 years prior, foretold how long they would have their punishment, how long they would endure the consequence for their disobedience. You know, I love the Bible because it's so very clear on how to identify a prophet of God. 
You know, there's uh, lots of people in our day who would claim to be prophets. Uh, I've met a few. And uh, so far, they've none, none, none of them have passed the test. You know, we, we just recently experienced in the last couple of years many people talking about the end of the world is going to be here on this day or that day, by the end of this year or that year. Countless times we've had people claim to be prophets. But the Bible tells us exactly how to tell the difference between a true prophet of God and a false prophet. Anybody know? Shout it out there. What they say happens. Isn't that great? If you say something on behalf of God and you're actually speaking on behalf of God, you know what's going to happen? What you say will actually happen. That's easy, right? To tell the difference between a false prophet and, and a true prophet. Well, we know Jeremiah was a true prophet. And that his book belongs in the Bible as the inspired Word of God. Why? Because what he foretold on behalf of the Lord came true. Nebuchadnezzar carried off the Israelites into captivity to Babylon in 606 B.C. Now, this is going to sound funny because we're, thinking, we're used to thinking of A.D. where the numbers go up to move forward in time. But in B.C., the numbers actually move down to uh, move forward in time. Cyrus... The, the, the king who's named here in verse 1, who, who is making this proclamation for the Israelites to return, makes this proclamation in the first year of his reign. And Cyrus's reign over the Babylonians, when he conquered the Babylonians, begins in 536 B.C. Now, if my math is still good from school, if you take 606 and subtract 536, you get 70. What Jeremiah said comes true. Verse 1 plainly tells us that it's the Lord that moved in the heart or stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, to make a proclamation. The proclamation was at the time was that the time of discipline was ending and the people could go back to their land. They could go back to the promised land. Look carefully at the proclamation that Cyrus makes. And notice two things. Just read with me uh, verses 2 through 4. This is the proclamation that Cyrus makes. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, says, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build a temple for Him at Jerusalem in Judea. Any one of His people among you, may His God be with Him, and let Him go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel, the God who is in Jerusalem. And the people of any, and the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with a free will offering for the temple of God in Jerusalem. So notice some things, notice some important things that are, are talked about in this proclamation that Cyrus makes concerning the people of Israel. First, God, that is, the one true God, has made Cyrus king. Who is it that establishes rulers and authorities in the world? Well, it's God who establishes rulers and authorities in the world. In uh, John chapter 19, when Jesus was on trial before Pilate, and uh, Pilate is, is a little agitated or astonished at Jesus' refusal to answer questions. You remember that? That, that he, didn't, he didn't respond to the accusations. And, and, and Pilate's like, aren't you going to answer me? Aren't you going to answer me? Don't you know that I have authority to, give you, to either set you free or put you to death? And, and listen to how the Lord Jesus Responds. This is in John chapter 19, verse 11, to this claim that Pilate makes. Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Who put Pilate in his place? Well, Jesus says it's God who put Pilate in his place. In Romans chapter 13, when Paul's talking about the need to submit to rulers and authorities, he says, Everyone, Romans 13, verse 1, everyone. That means all of us, no one, no exceptions. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. 
you know, that also means that they're accountable to God. In case, you know, you're watching the TV and you're thinking, how can the president or how can the prime minister do this or that? Uh, Bear in mind that God has put them in that place, but he also is going to hold them accountable, that every human being, great and small, will stand before the throne of the Lamb to be judged. God uses rulers and authorities of this world to establish and bring about His sovereign will in the world. Now you say, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because like, not everything is peachy keen in the world. But God does this for two reasons. There are two reasons why God establishes authorities. One is to bring about His blessings to a people who live in obedience to Him. And you can see that in the nation of Israel when they sought the Lord when they did that, was, that which was right. God set good kings. And it went well for them. They experienced God's blessings. When they rejected Him and they went in a different direction, there were less than good kings. And that took them in an even worse direction. So one reason is that God uses authorities to bestow His blessings upon people. The second reason is that God uses the rulers and authorities to bring about His judgment on a nation. I wonder where we are at as a nation. Why has God given us the leaders that we have to bless us or to judge us? I wonder. So first, God has established Cyrus as king and God establishes all rulers and authorities in the world. The second thing that we should notice from this proclamation is that God has given this man, this king, instruction to build a temple. And to build that temple in Jerusalem, in the promised land. The biggest consequence of God's judgment on people. The biggest consequence that God dealt out to the people of Israel and the biggest consequence that He can deal out to us is that He separated them from Himself. The temple is where, in in the Old Testament, is where He chose to manifest His presence in a special way. You can read about this in the book of 1 Kings when the the, uh, temple is completed. When Solomon finishes all the work on the temple and all the gold and all the, all the craftsmanship, it all comes to an end and they're dedicating the temple and God's glory, God's glory descends and dwells within the temple in a special way such that the priests have to leave. And this is where God chose in the Old Testament to manifest His glory in a special way. The temple is the proper place in the Old Testament for people to worship. It's the place where people could come and be with God. It was the the chief example that the God of the universe was in a covenant relationship with this people, the people of Israel. And for 70 years, it's been leveled. It's been destroyed. And the people have been cut off. And now, and now, this king, who is probably not even a believer, this king, God stirs in his heart to allow the people to go back to the land and to build what? To build a temple to God in Jerusalem. You know what? You know what? The time of consequence, the time of God's judgment on the nation of Israel, it's ending. It's coming to an end. It's like when my kids get to come out of their room. Woo! And that's kind of what it's like. The time of consequence is ending. So so God has established His rule. He's given Him an instruction to build the temple. And thirdly, notice in verse 3, the temple was to be built by Israelites. Cyrus could have easily have contracted a bunch of pagan workers and said, you know what, go build me a building in Jerusalem and we'll say it's for God. But that's not what God stirs in His heart to do. What God stirs in His heart to do is, look, let the people go. Let My people go so that they might come to Jerusalem and they might build the temple. God was calling His people home. He was calling them to Himself. 
And I believe that just as in that day when he was calling his people back to himself, I believe that's the greatest delight of God's heart, to call his people back to himself. And I believe it's still the greatest desire of his heart, is to call people to himself. God delights, this is the, if you're taking notes in the bulletin, this is the first point. God delights in providing His people with the opportunity to worship. Why should God take delight in this place that's made of brick and wood and metal? Because of the wood and the brick and the metal? No. God delights in this place because it's an opportunity for His children, for His people to come to Himself and to worship. And it is genuine, wholehearted worship in a building like this that brings pleasure and delight to the heart of God. Not the building itself. If you thank God, and and you should thank God for a place with four walls and a roof, and land which, the, which Christians can gather on to worship, we should thank God for that. And it is not to delight in, make much of the building itself. That's not why God has given us this place. God has given us this place so that we can delight in and make much of Him. God delights in providing His people with opportunity to worship. There's another important point to notice about Cyrus's proclamation. Notice verse 4. And the people of any place where survivors may now be living are to provide him with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. You see how, you see how great this is. You see, not only are they free to go back to the land, which is awesome. Just imagine being carted away from your home for 70 years and living in somebody else's dungeon for that long. And now, and now you're out of jail and you're free to go home. I don't know about you, but I love, I love to go home. I can vividly remember one summer as a Bible college student, I worked in... Uh, a place called Gas City, Indiana, uh, driving a fireworks truck. And there was, one, there was one point in the summer where you had to, they were looking for volunteers to go around to all the stores that they had delivered fireworks to and clean up or make sure that the displays were in good order. Well, um, one of the places that people had to go was Detroit. Everybody knows Detroit's just across the river from Windsor, right? Um, I have to say I was in some sketchy parts of Detroit at times and a little afraid. But it was the invitation to go home. I, I, I jumped at it. Yeah, send me there so I can go home. Uh, I, I, Michelle will tell you, I, I looked like I was in pretty rough shape. I had, led a, like I had like a two-inch beard. I had lost so much weight because you never take care of yourself when you're living you know, as a Bible college student. Uh, so I was very thin. I, I had a big cut on my face. I, I kind of looked like a pirate, actually. If I, had a, if I had a patch, it'd be perfect. But I still remember, I still remember when I crossed the border. I drove over the Ambassador Bridge from Detroit into, into Windsor. And it's like, man, it's good to be home. It's good to be home. And that's what this is like. They're coming, they're coming home. So not only were they free to go back, which is fabulous. Not only were they given the blessing to rebuild the temple. That's really great. But they were also given the resources to build it. They were captives. They had nothing. They they didn't have a dime to their name. And yet, Cyrus, through this proclamation, makes it so that they'll have the resources to build the temple. You know, it's important to note that the, the people in the towns and the places where the captive Israelites lived, these people had no great affection for, for Jewish people as they lived in this foreign land. But look at what it says in verses 6 through 8. 
verses 6 through 8. All their neighbors assisted them with articles of silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with valuable gifts in addition to all the free will offerings. Moreover, King Cyrus brought out the articles belonging to the temple of the Lord which Nebuchadnezzar had carried off from Jerusalem and had placed in the temple of his God. Cyrus, king of Persia, had them brought by Mithradath, the treasurer, who counted them out to Sheshbazar, the prince of Judah. This is kind of reminiscent of when the children of Israel left Egypt. You remember after the final plague and Pharaoh said, go, that God made the Egyptians favorable towards the Israelites and they gave them all kinds of stuff, gold and silver and livestock and, and, and many gifts. And surely these gifts here that are given to the people of Israel as they're going back in the land are the result of God moving or stirring the hearts of the people to give. Not only were they given much in the way of livestock and money, but Cyrus also gave them back the dishes and the bowls and the articles that were used to conduct worship in the temple. So God was sovereignly providing for these people all that they needed to restore worship. These bowls were the same bowls that Belshazzar, I love biblical names, they're so cool, king of Babylon, who was the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, in his drunkenness at a party, says, hey, go get those bowls, go get those cups from the temple that granddad brought from Jerusalem and we'll drink and we'll offer praises to our idols. And it was that very night that the handwriting appeared on the wall and that the days of the Babylonians ended and that they were conquered and the Persians took power. And now, and now, they were going back to Jerusalem with the intention of being used rightly to worship God. See, God not only provides His people with an opportunity to worship, but He also provides them with the means to worship. And I, I think there's a great lesson for us here, and that is God, God is never, He is never constrained by a shortage of resources. Know this, know this, that at a word, at a word, He can command the riches of the world. No wonder Jesus tells us to not worry. Let us be concerned about being faithful as Christians with whatever God has provided for us. We are to be, as Christians, we are to be diligent. We are to be hardworking. We are to be good stewards. All with the calm assurance that God gives us that what His heart desires, He will give us. And He will also give us the means to carry out the tasks to which He has called us. You ever had that thought in your mind? I can't do... I I know God's calling me to do something, but I can't do it because I just don't... Where is it going to come from? That's not how we should approach things. We should approach things with the perspective, look, I I understand what God's called me to do. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to be diligent. I'm going to be faithful. And I'm going to trust God. And whatever happens will be to His glory. So God provides the opportunity for worship. He provides the resources for worship. But there's one more thing He needs. Look at verse 5. Then... The family heads of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. It's it's great, it's wonderful to have the opportunity to worship. It's, It's great, it's wonderful to have the resources with which to worship. But if you have all the space and all the things... You do not yet have worship. I would suggest to you that then and now, the most important commodity in worship is people. Just as God moved in the heart of Cyrus to issue the proclamation, so He moved. It's the exact same word that's used here. So He moved or He stirred up in the hearts of people a desire to worship and to return to Jerusalem, and to rebuild the temple. 
Everyone who truly comes to know God through, through Christ comes to understand that this is the highest and best purpose for which we are made as human beings. To worship. To worship God is the reason why God made humanity. I would suggest to you that even in the Old Testament period where the temple was vital to worship, it was the right place for people to come and offer sacrifices and and to be with God. But even in that time, it was the heart's desire. It was the heart attitude of the people as they worshipped rightly that brings the most joy or that brought the most pleasure to God's heart. Even in that day where they needed the temple. Well, in our day, because of the cross, we no longer need the temple nor any building to enter the presence of God. A holy and awesome God. How much more, how much more should our hearts rejoice in worship? How much more should we be excited to gather together and worship? Finally, notice that it's not just one person who goes back to the land. You know, people talk today about, you know, I, I worship God just fine. I don't need the church. I, I'm not talking to you. You're, you guys are here. I love that. But you may hear others talk about that. Um, we're not going to go through this verse by verse in chapter 2, but if you have some time through the week, just read chapter 2 of Ezra and see how many people go back to the land. It's not just one person that goes back to the land, but it's a great number. Thousands of people go back to the land. It's not that God isn't pleased when we individually sing His praises. When you worship God in the shower, He's happy with that. It's not that He's not. He is. But I believe that the power of the Gospel is not only about restoring a right relationship with God, but it's about restoring a right relationship with one another. And having a vibrant relationship with one another as we join together to sing God's praises and to exalt His name. I believe that when God's people meet together to join their hearts to authentically worship their Creator, it gives God great pleasure. And in turn, He fills our hearts with His joy. Accepting God's invitation to worship, this is the third point, Accepting God's invitation to worship is to experience life's greatest blessing. I can say this with 100% genuineness and honesty. I am so glad to meet with you here in this place week after week. This ought to be the highlight of the week for you. And for me. And I hope that you are eager, eagerly or that have, the same amount, have the same amount of eagerness should have chose the word other than E to worship together. As long as the doors of any Bible-believing, true gospel-preaching church are open, God's invitation to worship Because He is extending an invitation to worship to people. God's invitation to worship is being extended to the world. That's what we want to be about. That's who we want to be as a congregation. is people who delight in gathering to join our hearts together for the common goal of exalting the name of our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh God, we stand in awe of You. We acknowledge Your holiness. We acknowledge Your perfection. We acknowledge Your superiority over all things. And we delight in singing Your praises. We delight in giving You glory. We delight in singing Your praises and declaring that all things come All good things come from You. God, help us to see even a fraction of Your glory. Help us to delight in conforming our lives for Your glory. 
Help us to see how to worship you rightly in light of the cross. I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.